Welcome to Crime and Caffeine. I'm your host, Erica. And I'm your host, Allison. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Today, we be sipping on a coffee we were actually recommended by my coworker, Julianne. So I work for a company based in California, and she said that Phil's coffee is just the poo out there. Like, people love this stuff. It's a cult classic, cult favorite. Everybody loves it. So we went ahead and ordered some. I bought the Filtered Soul, and the flavors are hazelnut and chocolate. And guys... I'm obsessed with it, and my husband is now really obsessed with it, so it's going to be a big issue, and I'm going to have to order it all the time. <laughs> and he literally calls it the yummy coffee. He's like, hey, can you make some of that yummy coffee? <laughs> I literally just saw someone talking about it on TikTok, too, so it's really funny. Yeah, and didn't you have somebody do a presentation, and they were like, I can't live without Phil's filtered Yeah, soul someone, someone at work. Um, was talking about it. So I guess everybody loves this one and I understand why. Yeah, it's so good. But apparently if you go to the actual Phil's coffee shops, they have crazy, amazing coffees that you can get in store. Not just like the brewed coffee that we're drinking. Do they have them anywhere else? I looked at the menu. I don't know. They have one here. I think they're like a... They have one by yeah, you? it's an old town. Oh, you have to go. Oh, I'm definitely oh going to go. Oh, they have a few. Okay. you learn something new every day. I'm so excited. Yeah, you really should go because every time I talk about it now, people are like, ugh, you have to get it at the store because all these crazy drinks and they're so good. They have five. They have five. <laughs> they're popping off in L.A., well, California in general, and then apparently they're popping off in Chicago. Erica will have to give us an update on the actual menu items, but for now, I'm giving you an update on this brewed coffee, and it is freaking good, and I will be ordering a million more, unless Phil's, you know, happens to be listening to this and wants to just send a lifetime supply to me and my husband, who is obsessed. I'm excited to hear about your case. Yes. So originally, I got a recommended case, and I was going to do it since it was from my coworker, Jeremy. And I was like, you know what? Julianne gave me a coffee. Jeremy gave me a case. Shout out, Jeremy. I'm just going to go ahead. (laughs) I didn't do the case that Jeremy gave me. Oh, never mind. (laughs) I will be doing it. I will be doing it. But while I was researching that case i found this case because it's another like famous bay area case and i was like "Ooh, what is this and then i was reading about it and i was in just enveloped in it Ooh, good word enveloped thank you guys so much for thirteen thousand downloads make sure you guys are following us on spotify and subscribed on apple Podcasts so that You can download those new apps every time they come in. That is usually every Wednesday. Unless we're feeling crazy and we do a Friday case. Yeah, (laughs) but usually you'll get like two parts with those. So we're we're trying to keep you guys happy. Now that we have thanked you a million times over, we can go ahead and get into the case if you want. I definitely want. Let's give the people what they want. (laughs) Yes, you might have already heard of this person because it is a famous serial killer, which I said I wasn't going to do again, but here I am doing it again. Do you know who the doodler is? I don't. You don't know the doodler? I cannot say that I'm familiar with the doodler. Okay, well, today we're going to just, we're going to take out a piece of paper and we're going to doodle all over it. (laughs) On January 27th, 1974, the police got a call at about 1.30 a.m. by an unknown caller. The caller said, I believe there might be a dead person on the beach across from Uloa Street. If you follow the street right down to the water, I thought I saw somebody laying there. But I didn't want to get too close to him because you never know what could happen. You always do cases where people end up on the beach. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. Was it Annie? Yes, it was. 
Skateboard Jessen. She was on she the was beach. She was on the yeah. beach. I forgot about that. Anyway, when the operator asked if the man wanted to give his name, he responded, no, I don't think that's necessary. I just wanted to let somebody know. Maybe he needs help or something, but I felt that it was my duty to report it, and then he hung up. Police drove down to Ocean Beach, and lo and behold, there was a body of a man at the edge of the water, nearly minutes from being washed away by the waves. They dragged him back onto the dry sand and saw that he was about 50 years old. He was balding. He was heavy set. He had 17 stab wounds, front and back, including on his hands, which would lead people to believe that he tried to fight off his killer. His body was, as the coroner's register put it, in a supine position. What is that? And showed a supine position. Mm Mm-hmm. So supine is <laughs> supine's when you're just like laying straight up. Prone is when you're like laying on your stomach. Supine is when you're laying on your oh. back. Oh. So I guess I didn't have to get all technical about it. He was just laying on no, his back. No, it's okay. You're you sound smart. I'm so smart. Actually, it's what the coroner said. I didn't really say <laughs> it. <laughs> and he showed signs of slight rigor mortis. The body had underwear on, shoes, socks, pants, a shirt, and a jacket. And in the pocket of the jacket was $21.12, and he had a Timex on his wrist. Mm. There was no ID on the man, and no one had any idea who the caller might have been, but they just said that the voice on the phone sounded young. It said that a few hours before in one of the city's many gay bars is where this man met his assailant. It's believed that the man was younger, charismatic, and a talented artist. He would prey on men at local gay bars in Polk Gulch, the Tenderloin, and the Castro. So if you're familiar with San Francisco or the Bay Area, Castro's a very well-known gay area, predominantly gay area. Um, But there are other ones as well. So he would pick a guy and then he would quickly sketch or doodle, some might say, the man that he was trying to get with, show the guy, flatter him, and then he would suggest that they needed to walk away, you know, to engage in some canoodling, some extracurriculars, if you catch my drift, if you if you're going the same I'm lane as picking I up what you're putting down. Thank you. This was only his first victim. It's believed that there are no less than 14 people that were murdered by this person, but only five were confirmed. The man on the beach was confirmed to be Gerald Cavanaugh after a few days of investigating a furniture finisher, possibly at a mattress factory, supposedly from Canada. That was about the extent of any known facts about him. Genealogy sites tracked Kavanaugh's lineage to Montreal. They found out that he was born there in 1923. And a researcher finally found a niece who didn't really want to be named, so we're not going to name her. But that led police to other relatives as well. And finally, the picture that they received of him in color that they could put in the news. Kavanaugh had left home at a young age and did a 21-month stint in the U.S. Army at the end of World War II. He wound up in Haight-Ashbury by the 1970s, presumably to immerse himself in sexual freedom, blossoming there at the time. Uh, It's nearby Castro, so. It was relatively easy for the killer to go hunting in the mid-1970s. There was very little mainstream press coverage for LGBTQ murder victims, A few short pieces appeared when the doodler had the bodies turn up, but a couple of longer pieces later, when it became very clear that gay men were being stabbed to death um, at an alarming rate, there was one article called The Sado Murder Horror, and that was the splashy headline of a story they wrote in January 1976 in The Chronicle, and that was six months after the last recorded doodler attack. So it took... Five major murders for somebody to finally write like a larger article about it. And that's why it was so easy for this person to attack. So we will go over the second victim now. In 1974, the second victim was Jay Stevens, 
who did a wonderful Julie Andrews drag routine at the local PS Lounge in Polk Gulch and world-famous Finocchio's in North Beach. The late Bay Area reporter columnist Don McLean wrote that Stevens had, quote, a face that launched a thousand sailors, high cheekbones, long wavy hair the color of straw, and eyes like a doe. On June 25th, 1974, his body was found beside a tree at Spreckles Lake by a woman out for an early morning jog in Golden Gate Park. He'd last been seen at the Cabaret Club in North Beach where he was performing. Similar to Kavanaugh, he'd been stabbed in a rage, front and back. He was beaten so badly, in fact, that his family was barely able to recognize his corpse. There was blood in his mouth and nose, and Jay was the only doodler victim to grow up in the Bay Area, so he was a little bit easier to find facts on or research on. Um, Still, there wasn't much to go off of. The Sentinel paper had run some homages to his career and described the pain that his death was causing the LGBTQ community. But the Chronicle only ran a short story inside the paper with no details beyond just basic murder outline. So again, we are seeing that there's no coverage. If there is coverage, it's very little. The third confirmed victim was 31-year-old Klaus Christman. He was a German national and employee of Michelin. He was last seen alive at Bojangles on July 7th, 1974, found at Lincoln Way by the beach. Tauba Weiss, now she's 88, was walking her dog, Moondance, and discovered his body. I know, what a cute Why do I dog. love that name? I know. Also very San Francisco of her to name her dog Moondance. <laughs> anyway, she was walking Moondance when she discovered the body. Quote, the dog was running and I followed him. I knew something was wrong. I saw a man laying there and he wasn't moving. I knew he was dead. She returned home and called the police. Chrisman's throat was slashed in three places and he was stabbed at least 15 times. Inspector David Toshi reported to the Sentinel, the murder was one of the most vicious stabbings he had ever seen. And he was like a veteran. He was a 20 year veteran of the department. And he also, fun fact, was one of the investigators on the Zodiac murders. No way. So, for, yeah, for this to be one of the most vicious stabbings he had ever seen says a lot. Mans has seen it all. He has. He done been there, seen that. At his death, Christman wore a tan leather jacket, black zipper ankle boots with brown Cuban heels a white Italian shirt, orange bikini briefs, one blue moonstone ring, and one brown cameo ring, along with the gold wedding band. According to a Homicide Division information bulletin, Crispin was also found with a makeup tube in his pocket, which suggested, quote, homosexual propensities. At the time the Sentinel ran its first story on the murders, Chrisman hadn't been identified yet, and the paper published a photo that appeared to have been taken in the morgue. Chrisman had a wife and two children and had been staying with friends named Mr. and Mrs. Booker Williams, and he'd been in the city for about three months, and his body was returned to Bamberg, Germany for the burial. On to our fourth confirmed victim, He was a Vietnam War veteran, or should I say Vietnam War hero. His name was Frederick Kappen. He was 32, and he was found dead on May 12, 1975, by a hiker behind a sand dune near the streets of Vincent and, again, Eola Street. So it seems to be a theme in his dumping places, or at least the places that he's taking these people to. Frederick was six feet tall and about 140 pounds. He was wearing a blue corduroy jacket, multicolored Picasso-esque shirt, blue jeans, brown socks, brown shoes, and blue underwear. His jacket and shirt were soaked in blood. The coroner determined that the cause of death was stab wounds to the aorta and heart. 
There were marks in the sand leading to Frederick, indicating that he was dragged about 20 feet. Frederick had a sister who lived in Port Angeles, Washington. The local paper, the Port Angeles Daily News, ran an obituary for him. He was a medical corpsman in the Navy and the recipient of a commendation medal for saving four men under fire in the Vietnam War. That is why we called him a hero. Frederick was easy to identify because he was a registered nurse and his fingerprints had already been taken by the state. He lived with his grandparents while attending school. So the fifth and last confirmed victim at 66, making him the oldest victim, was Harold Goldberg. He was killed on June 4th, 1975, originally known as John Doe 81. He was found at Lincoln Park Golf Course by a hiker 10 yards off the trail. He was slashed across the throat. His pants were unzipped and he wore no undergarments. The San Francisco Chronicle reported that he'd been dead for approximately two weeks and really gross, but, you know, we got to go over it. There were maggots and fly larvae occupying ew, his face. Ew, ew, ew. I don't like those words. So sorry. So it's sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just like when I was writing it, I was like picturing it and it was really, it was not it for me. I am might have gagged a bit. Harold was not a healthy man. According to the pathologist's report, Goldberg suffered from portal cirrhosis, which is his liver basically killing him. Goldberg was Swedish and a sailor by profession. He was tattooed on both arms, and according to immigration records, between June 1930 and July 1940, he stopped in numerous harbors, including Boston, Puerto Vida, Cuba, Shanghai, Melbourne, San Luis Obispo, Yokohama, and Liverpool. He became a naturalized citizen on August 15, 1955. More than a year after the doodler killings began, little progress had been made on the case. It would be nice to think that the doodler murder's unsolved status was, you know, an abnormality, but it was not. When on May 2nd, Nick Granny Goose Bauman was found dead in a south of market basement, his skull fractured. He was the 21st murder and unsolved murder of San Francisco's gay men during the last year and a half. Guilford, who was on the case, said that the 29 year old man's scrotum looked like somebody had stomped them into nothing. So there was clearly almost, in my opinion, like a war on the gay men in this area at the time. These were clearly rage murders and hate crimes that were continuing and not being solved because, well, nobody gave a crap about it. Several years ago, Elon Green wrote to the University of Arizona's Susan Stryker, who had written a book called Gay by the Bay, a history of queer culture in San Francisco's Bay Area. Um, there was a line in her book that pertained to the doodler's case. She wrote, quote, The only people I found who remembered the killings were trans women who lived in the Tenderloin at the time. It is very poorly remembered episode in San Francisco's LGBTQ history. Obviously, in a plea for tips from the public, police released a new sketch of what the suspect may look like in 2019, as well as an audio recording of the call to police dispatch by the unknown man who reported seeing the body along the beach. Police described him as a 19 to 25 year old at the time, black, lanky, and six feet tall. The new sketch released was an age progression based on the 1975 drawing. This drawing that they're referring to in 1975 was from a description given from two men that were attacked at the same apartment complex in the 1970s, both stabbed with knives and injured in a similar manner to the victims. Police say they believe the suspect lived in the Bay Area but not San Francisco and would come to the city on weekend nights. In 1976, police detained a suspect who was never charged. Police Commander Greg McEachern 
didn't release his name, but said police have interviewed the man who is still alive and a person of interest. He wouldn't say whether the person matched the sketches released. In a 1977 Associated Press story, police said that they had identified a suspect, but he could not be charged because three survivors, including a well-known entertainer, a diplomat, and I think the other one was maybe like a CEO, somebody very important. There were like three very very important. important people. Yeah, and they were very reluctant to come out of the closet to testify against him because they would obviously... This guy was going after gay men. So that was like a big deal considering they had people who could testify against a man, but because they didn't want to come out of the closet, they couldn't do anything about it. In a USA Today article released in February of 2019, police also believed the doodler was seeing a psychiatrist with the last name Priest practicing in the East Bay, and they were seeking information about him from this person. He claimed that a young black male confessed to the murders during a private therapy session in the mid-1970s. The therapist also allegedly said that his client was struggling with his own homosexual impulses and may have turned to murder as an attempt to exercise his inner demons. Mm. Mm. In January of 2022, a.k.a. this year, (laughs) welcome, 2022, we're here, San Francisco police revealed that a sixth victim may be linked to the doodler. He had been suspected in, obviously, five homicides of gay white men from January 1974 to June of 1975, but the potential sixth victim had been tied to the killer exactly 48 years after the first victim was killed. Holy. Cold case detectives Dan Cunningham and Dan Dedit investigated the death of Warren Andrews. On April 27, 1975, so this does fit in the time frame, Andrews was found unconscious and never regained consciousness, dying several weeks later. Investigators have spent years trying to identify the killer who they believe targeted men at gay clubs and restaurants around San Francisco and often had sex with them before he attacked them. Four bodies were found around Ocean Beach, and a fifth body was found at Golden Gate Park. Andrews was attacked near Land's End, a popular hiking spot north of Golden Gate Park, about 1.5 mile walk north of Ocean Beach. But while the other victims were stabbed to death, Andrews was bludgeoned with a rock and a tree branch. Cunningham told the Chronicle that he had to reconsider Andrews' murder as part of the case, given the location and the victimology at the time period. The San Francisco Police Department has increased the reward from $100,000 to $200,000 for information leading to the identification apprehension, and conviction of the serial homicide suspect. If you or somebody you know has any information, please call the San Francisco Police Department's 24-hour tip line at 415-575-4444 or text a tip to tip411. Also, if you guys are interested, San Francisco Chronicle reporter Kevin Fagan, also a Pulitzer Prize-nominated reporter, did host an eight-part podcast about the killings with private investigator Michael Taylor. It's called, literally, it's just called The Doodler. So I recommend that if you're still interested and want to know all the nooks and crannies of the case, you can head over to that podcast because it is literally dedicated to this case. Oh, wow. Um, But yeah, so that's The Doodler, and nobody knows who it is, and it's still unsolved. How do you feel about that? I know you hate them. I hate an unsolved. (laughs) I do. But I think this was interesting to me because it was a serial killer and it was unsolved. But I don't know. Just part of it really irked me and I felt the need to say something because of the victimology, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like, it was so – I mean, I'll get – 
I'll get into it um, literally in like my next little blurb in the psychology. But I just really that time was not it for the LGBTQ community and people perceived them in such a way, such a negative way. The fact that so many gay men were murdered at this time and nobody did anything about it or really cared to do anything about it. That's why I felt the need to do this case. And I'm hoping that it brings a little more, what am I trying to say? A little more awareness, coverage, knowledge, awareness to the doodler because he's fucked up. I want to see what this guy looks like. I just picture him looking like a doodle. There's an original sketch, and then there's the age progression one, so you can look at both of those online. Damn. Okay, so let's get into some psychology. Obviously, these murders began only a year after the APA stopped classifying homosexuality as a mental disorder and ended about six years before the CDC classified San Francisco resident Ken Horn as the first confirmed HIV patient. So just to give you a little bit of background into what was going on at the time, the police said that they believe the killer had a quiet, serious personality with an upper middle class education and above average intelligence, possibly an art student as he had told a few of the surviving victims that he was either studying commercial art or was employed as a cartoonist. The police had never released any of the doodles or drawings. The police also indicated that the suspect had a history of mental difficulties involving sex. One of the city's newspapers went further into stating the killer had sexual identification problems and was undergoing psychiatric care on an outpatient basis, as we know. According to San Francisco Chronicle, the perpetrator said to more than one surviving victim, All you gays are the same. What? Him? Okay. The manner in which he killed these victims was obviously, like, really brutal and had a great deal of rage behind it, as we can tell. So first, I want to go over something known as homosexual panic. Oh, my God. When did we talk about this? It was your devil case during Pride Month. Uh Uh-huh. You're right. Matthew Shepard and James Byrne. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we did go over it then, and we will go over it now. Homosexual panic is defined by the APA as a sudden acute anxiety attack precipitated by the unconscious fear that one might be gay or lesbian or will act out gay or lesbian impulses, the fear of being sexually attacked by a person of the same sex, or loss of or separation from a same-sex partner. This term was first coined by psychiatrist Edward J. Kempf in 1920. Despite the psychotic nature of the disorder, Kempf called it acute homosexual panic, and the disorder is now also known as Kempf's disease. Oh. Well, it's just like um, gymnastics. If you figure something out or if you're the first person to do a skill, they name it after you. (laughs) I guess so. The condition most often occurs in people who suffer from schizoid personality disorders who have insulated themselves from physical intimacy. Breakdowns often occur in situations that involve enforced intimacy with the same sex, such as dormitories or military barracks. It was most common during the mass mobilization of World War II. When barracks typically provided little privacy with communal showers and often no doors or cubicles around toilets. So that is what homosexual panic is. Next, I wanted to go into rage type homicide because this guy was clearly angry and brutal with the way he murdered people. So, in the South African Journal of Psychology, Duncan Cartwright wrote the role of psychopathology and personality in rage-type homicide. This article reviews the role of 
psychopathology, and personality in offenders who have committed acts of rage-type murder. The possible role of depression, PTSD, psychotic disorders, intellectual functioning, and alcohol-slash-drug use are critically considered. It's argued that although some forms of psychopathology may be indicated in some cases, these still remain in the minority. This seems to be consistent with findings that describe such offenders as apparently normal. In an attempt to explain this further, the character profile and psychodynamics of personality are reviewed. A pattern of overcontrol is isolated as the key theme that best explains the, you know, apparent normality of a rage type offender. And it's argued that a particular type of borderline personality organization best explains the character's pattern. Lastly, I wanted to dive into a little combination of things. It seems that this man might have been gay himself and couldn't handle it or was simply very angry, possibly scared or fearful that he was gay. So we'll talk about fear-based anger. According to... Psychology Today, a leading criminologist, Dr. Robert Agnew at Emory University, developed the GST, also known as the General Strain Theory of Crime. So we're going to look at that in the case of, you know, the primary motive for violence. According to the GST, crime, including acts of violence, is the result of emotional strain in one's life. Strain can result from either losing something of value, such as your career or marriage, or it can result from failing to attain something of value, such as financial stability or educational goals. Strain can also result from having dysfunctional and strained personal relationships. Strain in one's life leads to negative emotions, such as sadness, depression, anxiety, or anger. And according to the GST, When negative emotions take the form of anger, they're most likely to lead to acts of crime, particularly violence. Anger and rage are associated with a wide variety of violent acts, including homicide, aggravated assault, rape, domestic violence, child abuse, bullying, torture, even terrorism. The relationships between anger and violence make perfect sense when you consider that anger, particularly when it escalates into rage, is an act of emotion fueled by adrenaline. Anger demands action and violence provides kind of a cathartic release or response to the adrenaline-fueled demands of anger. Significantly, the criminal perpetrator who strikes out in blind rage is often unable to explain his own violent behavior after the fact. Such acts of violence committed in a blind rage are often referred to as crimes of passion. (sighs) So what are your thoughts? Um, I definitely think that he was a raging, closeted, homophobic individual. I'm try I was trying to like look on Reddit and see like what the theories were as to like who it was. Did you happen to like look into any or do you have any? I didn't see much. They did say that, um, They said that it was going on at the same time as... It wasn't the Night Stalker. Was it the Golden Gate? Golden State. There you go. Yeah, 74 to 18. There were so many people in the 70s. Ted Bundy, dating Uh, game killer, Robert Hansen, the Butcher Baker, even though that was in Alaska. Yeah, but I don't have any theories on, like, who it was. I just know that there were other serial killers like the Golden State Killer going on at the time. John Wayne Gacy. He had, like, the same yeah. M.O. too. Shit was loaded. Yeah, 70s. Not not a decade I would have wanted to be hanging out in, but... But yes, I agree with you. This man, clearly, he was either incredibly homophobic or he was gay himself and couldn't handle it and lashed out and murdered people who were gay because he couldn't handle it. Which I feel like that's the case for all the like serial killers who their main victim is like gay men and boys. I feel like it's not even just like I mean it is intense homophobia but it's coming from a place of internalized because they're gay. I agree with you. 
And that, my friends, is the doodler. Look at you. A very um a very not so scary name for something that is pretty scary. Yeah, seriously. When I saw it, that's why I was so confused. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> and when I started reading it, I'm like, the doodler. How did we come well, I get where they came up with it, but that's all I got. Well, hopefully now that DNA and everything, technology, maybe we can figure this one out. I hope so. I hope it's not unsolved forever. And the fact that they're still working on it um, to this day, that things have been coming out at, I mean, as much as January of this year. So they're not done with this. And I'm hoping that something comes up and we can figure out who the hell it was. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, Hit us up with some case suggestions. We've been doing a lot lately. Want to keep them going. I need some fresh ideas. I feel like all of the ones I've had in my head are like the same ideas I've had for a really long time. So like I want, I need some inspo. So send it our way. You guys can DM us on social media. Everything is at Crime on Caffeine. Go ahead, um, head over to our website, crimeoncaffeine.com and submit a case or just send us an old fashioned email, crimeoncaffeine at gmail.com. Don't forget to keep posting us on your stories. We definitely want you guys to, you know, share our podcast with your friends, your family, your coworkers, your baristas, whoever you wanted to share it with. Please do. Your hair ladies, your nail ladies, whoever. We love it. We will be back again next week. So we hope to see you then. <laughs>